Hi, everyone, and welcome back to Age Better, where each week we take a deep dive into all the ways we can feel better, look better, live better, and yep, age better. I'm your host, Barbara Hannah Grufferman. As many of you already know, my passion for positive aging went into high gear when I turned 50 and wrote my first book. It's a subject that's near and dear to my heart, and I love, love, love having people on the show who totally get it and who also want to help us all to age better. My guest today is the remarkable Chip Conley, co-founder of the Modern Elder Academy, a New York Times bestselling author, a great speaker who has given a few motivating TED Talks, and above all, a trailblazer in transforming how we view aging. Chip has just written a brand new book, which is a gem, called Learning to Love Midlife, 12 Reasons Why Life Gets Better with Age. And it really does, by the way. (laughs) But really, it's more than a book. It's a manifesto for all of us looking to age a heck of a lot better. So you know what to do. Get comfortable, pop in your earbuds, and tune in to the wisdom and inspiration that Chip is about to share. Stay tuned. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Age Better. I'm your host, Barbara Hannah Grufferman. Joining me today is Chip Conley, who is the co-founder of the Modern Elder Academy. He'll tell us a little bit more about that soon. And he's also a New York Times bestselling author. And in fact, he's just come out with a new book, which is why I asked him to come on the show, Learning to Love Midlife, 12 Reasons Why Life Gets Better with Age. And oh, gosh, indeed it does. You know, I believe that. (laughs) Chip, welcome to Age Better. Uh, thank you, Barbara. It's great to be here. I appreciate people who are part of this sort of common fellowship we have as activists out there in the world talking about why aging can actually be a good thing. Yeah. And when I started in this world, you know, I was in corporate America for most of my adult life and then entered this when I turned 50 and had my, what the heck is going on? I'm turning 50. Now what? Moment. Yeah. And, uh, you know, there really weren't as many of us talking about positive aging. So really, I'm so happy that you are in this space and, and you have a very loud voice, which is really wonderful. So, uh, so we're going to take a deep dive. I'll take dive. that as a compliment. Yeah, absolutely. So okay. we're going to take a deep dive into my favorite topic of conversation, aging better, which is what mm-hmm. this podcast is all about. And anyone who knows me knows how I feel about it. Very good. Very positive. But how do you feel about aging? Chip. Well, I have to say that I probably didn't give it a lot of attention until my you started. 40s. Well, <laughs> until you started yeah, aging, I mean, right? Well, I mean, we start aging when we were born. I, this is one of my key points is like aging and growth are the same thing. We're aging from the time we're born. So aging, you know, to be aged past tense doesn't sound very good. That's actually to be very old. But I think we're aging our whole lives. But we sort of call it growing. Because physically, up until, you know, maybe our early 20s. And then we're, no one would call it aging. No, you're you're aging in your 20s. No, you don't. Although, frankly, there's a lot of articles recently in the New York Times about Gen Z using Botox. Like, that's a scary (laughs) thought. Worrying about aging and worrying about dying. I mean, they're already kind of, yeah. Which is so something that you usually hit in your 40s or 50s. So I think for me, when it really kicked in was in my late 40s when I was having a very rough time. I had a, an NDE, a near-death experience, where I died from a, an allergic reaction to an antibiotic. And I, it happened at a time where I was in my darkest place in my life. So to have an NDE, a near-death experience, going flatline nine times in 90 minutes, while I was in a very dark place in terms of what was happening in my life, while I had five male friends, age 42 to 52, take their own lives, I think it really helped me to sort of say like, okay, I probably didn't wake up and say like, okay, I want to focus on aging, but I did want to focus on how do you shift your choice around midlife to take a different path? And there's not much in the way of schools or tools or rites of passage or rituals to help people with that. And the U-curve of happiness research is pretty conclusive saying that, you know, 45 to 50 is the low point of life satisfaction across cultures. And then after 50, we get happier with each decade. So I started getting fascinated with the research. And then I had my opportunity 
at age 52 after I'd sold my boutique hotel company to be the modern elder at Airbnb. And they called me, the founders called me the modern elder because I was as curious as, as I am wise is what they said to me. And that's when I really saw my age, like, oh, I am twice the age of the average person here. Mm-hmm. And I ultimately wrote a book about it called Wisdom at Work, The Making of a Modern yeah, Elder based, a wonderful based upon book. my experience. And there will Thank be you. links to that book as well in the show notes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That was a wonderful experience. I mean, you talk about a lot of these things you just were saying in your great book, your new book. Thank you. Yeah. Learning to Love Midlife. And this intergenerational approach is one of the points that you make in the book. And that's so important. And you were living that. And so you're a perfect oh. example of that when you were at uh, the company. Airbnb. Airbnb. Yeah. As the I mean, modern, for, first modern elder that they the had. The first modern elder. For seven and a half years, four years full-time and then three and a half years part-time, I had to own my age and I didn't want to run away from it. There's a word I use in, in my new book, Learning to Love Midlife, called age fluid. Yes. And when you're age fluid, I mean, we hear about gender fluid these days, but age fluid is a different thing, but sort of similar in the sense that you can't pinpoint a person's chronological age and they don't, at least they can't, you don't want to pinpoint your chronological age nor your generation. You want to be all the ages you've ever been and all the ages you've ever, you will ever be. And you see your age as sort of like a costume you wear, but it doesn't necessarily define who you are. I believe that when I was at Airbnb, I was quite age fluid <laughs> because, you know, I was, I was a, a founding member of Burning Man, uh, the Burning Man nonprofit. So that was really cool. The That's very mo- cool. Mo- the millennials. <laughs> That's like, very oh, cool, yeah. Chip. <laughs> exactly. So like, okay, I'm in my mid fifties by that, you know, early to mid fifties and like, oh yeah, he's got a Burning Man background or, he, <laughs> or you know, I mean, I, he's best friends with Michael Franti, the musician and. And so I think age fluidity is something that we should aspire to because the word we would have used in the past is ageless. And the real reason I think that age fluid is even better, and I, you know, I don't think it'll take off because I think ageless is what people are familiar with, but ageless suggests you have less age, which suggests that age is a bad thing. And I know I'm pushing a rock up the hill and you are too on this one because yep. we have an anti-aging industrial complex that is mostly an anti-women complex, let's be clear, that right. is trying to make us feel badly about our aging process. And that it wants to sell us products and services that are going to make us feel young again. And ageless. A word, by the way, that I never personally use. I know. Good. I think, you know, you and I never. are so, so compatible on this because I just think, you know, saying someone is ageless, it, it is an ageist statement. Yeah, it it's is. It's just an ageist statement. It is. And most people wouldn't figure that out until you sort of point out and they say like, oh, you're right, yep. you know, but then they'll say like, but of course no one wants to get older. No one wants to feel older. No one wants to look older. And that's why I wrote the book. And the subtitle of the book, Learning to Love Midlife is 12 Reasons Why Life Gets Better with Age. Because we know all the things that get worse with age because the world will tell us that, including Hallmark cards. Hallmark Every cards day. is part of the conspiracy. They will tell us what gets worse with age. And so I wanted to say like, hey, based upon my own personal experience, based upon the 4,000 plus people from 47 countries who've come to Baja in Mexico to our campus, our MEA, Modern Elder Academy campus, and soon to be in Santa Fe, where I, I am right now, we have a campus opening here. And based upon social science research, there's so many examples of what gets better with age. And I wanted to point out the 12 that I thought that were, were the most important. Really, really important. And everyone, you must read this book. I love this book. Now, you are making the rounds because of the book coming out. Yeah. On the morning talk shows. On- I know the Today Show and I Good know, Morning so, America. Yay. So wonderful. <laughs> that is so, so Thank wonderful. You. And you're also online. You're like, you're on a lot of podcasts, other podcasts yeah. other than this one. Yeah. And including yes. the Rich Roll podcast. Yeah. I listened to it. It's, it was a two hour conversation. So I got to know a lot about you. Really, yeah. he has a wonderful way of going very deep. And I yeah. appreciate that. One thing, I'm, I learned many things about you, but one thing that I learned that I just love, and I went, oh my gosh, I love this man so much. I can't wait to talk <laughs> with him, is that you don't like the term late bloomer either. I don't like that term at all. I don't like it. I think it's yeah. just like, well, what, wait a minute, what does that mean? Oh, I wrote my first book at 50. 
I mean, I should have written it when I was earlier, but I wasn't ready until I was yeah. 50. I ran my first marathon at 50. I wasn't ready before then. So that makes me yeah. a late bloomer. No, I don't like that term. What about you? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I dislike ageless more, but at late bloomer, the reason, <laughs> the reason I'm not a fan of a late bloomer is it suggests that there is a time that you're supposed to do everything. Yeah, and to me it, that goes against the whole idea of age fluidity. To me, it's like right. th they're opposite. It say, suggests that when we were growing up, Barbara, we used to play the game of life. Remember that, yeah, that sure. board game? Yep. And when you played the game of life, there was one path. There was no deviation. And you had your little plastic car and you got your tokens. And when you got married or you had kids or you got your first job or you bought your first home, you got these tokens. It was really like, like the all-American success story brainwash, to, put, to be honest with you. Absolutely. And I think late, late bloomer is sort of part of that. It says like, hey, there is a sequence in which everybody is supposed to do things. And if you don't do it at the time that most people do it, you might be a late bloomer. And so it's sort of a derogatory term in some ways. I sort of like it too, though. The, the, what I like about it is it does suggest that you can bloom at any age. And this is true. Okay. Yeah, okay. Yeah. I'll give you that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> this whole idea of life, as you were just describing it. And yeah, I mean, so many kids now, they are graduating and they from high school and they'll take a gap year, maybe even go mm. to work and then go back to school. It's like all of that is, it's almost like life fluidity. You know, yeah. I just ooh, love that whole concept, ooh, life good. fluidity. You know, yeah. like we shouldn't, none of us, no matter what our age, should be expecting expected to do certain things according to the game of life, as There's you just described it. Laura Carstensen at Stanford Center on Longevity and the authors in, in the UK of The 100-Year Life really focus on this, about the tyranny of the three-stage life. And Mark Friedman also does this. And he basically yes. says, like, hey, you know, up to 20 to 25, you learn. Between 20 to 25 to 60 to 65, you earn. And then after 60 or 65, you adjourn or burn or you return in terms of giving back. But it's like these, there's like a th tyranny of the three-stage life where, you know, you're not supposed to go back to school to get your master's at age 40. You're not supposed to take a gap year at age 50. You're not supposed to actually be dating at age 60. Just a, a basic framework. It also says, hey, let's keep the generations apart from each other. <laughs> and I, I just, it's, as Mark Friedman calls it, age apartheid. And I just think there's such a need for us to, to create an intergenerational potluck. And the intergenerational, intergenerational potluck allows us, whatever generation we are, to bring to the table that which we know or do best. Yeah. No, I... It's wonderful. Everything that you all, everyone that you just referenced to, so highly yeah. regarded. I respect them all so much. Mm. And I really pay attention to anything that they are saying or coming out with in, in terms of research and the like. Uh, one thing I want to bring up is that on the ritual podcast, mm -hmm. but also in, in other places, you've, you have referenced the fact that your cancer has returned. I know where you're and, going. <laughs> and you, you're under treatment again, which is yeah. remarkable. You're a strong human, Chip. And Thank you. How has this really informed how you view aging? Yeah. And so everybody has background. About five and a half years ago, I learned I had stage one prostate cancer. Not too concerning. Prostate cancer tends to move slowly. And it was stage one. But I found out the day after... Wait, yes. The day after my book, Wisdom at Work, came out, I was in New York. And it was the day before I was giving a TED Talk. And so it was like, oh, this is sort of weird timing. And then I went to stage two about two to three years later. And that's when I had some surgery. I didn't have the full radical prostatectomy yet. We had something called HIFU, which burned the about half of my prostate where the cancer was. And, and it, was, it was a serious surgery. And catheter and all, except, you know, it was, it was like, oh, okay. The, hum the humbling experience of going through things that where your body is not operating like it used to. And then it went to stage three about a year ago. And that's when we had to start making some very difficult decisions, which included going on uh, what's called ADT. So androgen deprivation therapy, which means basically getting rid of the testosterone in my body. I, I have 1% of the normal testosterone I would have in my body. 
and then having a radical prostatectomy, having my, basically my prostate taken out, out mm -hmm. and then having 36 sessions of radiation. So what I will say is that, and 2023 was sort of a, the highlight year of all of that. I'm still back. I'm now back on the ADT again. So just because they don't know when with the radiation, it takes three or four months for them to really know whether it worked. Right. Long story short is I've wanted to see cancer as my teacher. And that's not easy, because, especially when people are sort of saying, yeah, kill cancer. It's like a, you know, a gladiator uh, fight. Right, but battle. I, a battle, exactly. And there's, so, there's certainly some of that too. But I actually, I've tried to look at it instead as saying, you know, what am I supposed to learn from this? And it has helped me to see a few things, everything from I need to ask for help. I'm not very good at that. I, I can't always try to be the rugged individualist hero. I have a very active and curious life, and yet I'm so possessed and feel the calling of MEA now and running a the world's first midlife wisdom school, that I sometimes don't give enough time to other parts of my life, how I treat my body. There was a time a year or two ago, I was like, okay, I'm failing my body or my body's failing me as if my body's not my best friend. What if my body's my best friend? What if my job is to actually just make a beautiful relationship with my body? And I think you do this very well, Barbara, in such a way that- my best. <laughs> yeah. And I don't do it necessarily for short-term vanity, but I do it for long-term maintenance. Right. And I think of our body as a rental vehicle that we were issued at birth. And part of our job is to take care of this vehicle. And the truth is, the more mileage you have on the vehicle, on our body, the older you are, the more the exterior of the car may not look like it did when you drove it off the lot. Right. But what matters most is what it feels like on the inside as you're driving this body. And so all of these things have been lessons that have led me to looking at my cancer as, you know, bad circumstance. I don't, if I had to choose between having it or not having it, I'd, I'd choose not to have it, especially stage three, because that means it's spread beyond the prostate. It's actually in my lymphs. And so long story short is I, it, what it also does is it makes me m so much more focused on the present moment and so much more focused on what my purpose on earth is. And I want to feel like, wow, if I only have two years left or 20 years left or 40 years left, I want to operate as Gandhi once said, which is learn as if you'll be here forever, live as if this is your last day or something like that. Yeah, it's, it's a beautiful be quote. It's a beautiful sentiment. Yeah. And so important. And I think that people listening right now, it's important because they themselves might be having this experience that you are or know yeah. someone because we are of this age group where the risk is higher, obviously. So I so yeah. appreciate your sharing all of that with us. Yeah, thank you. I want you to please tell us about the Modern Elder Academy. I'm very familiar yeah. with it. I haven't attended, although I'd love to. But You're going to, you're going people, to, Barbara. Yeah. <laughs> I would love to. It's actually, yeah. okay, very much on my to-do list, just so you know. Okay. And so I will make that happen. Before we get to that, and I do want everyone mm -hmm. to know what it is and why you started it, but I just want to let you know, I just think that this whole concept of aging and the discussion, the discourse about it has really, in my mind, been very focused on women and our needs, as you pointed out earlier, because really mm -hmm. a lot of the focus is on yeah. women. How are you looking and the whole ageism? Right. And I really feel there was a bit of a gap because I know my own focus is more on women's health. I focus a lot on menopause. I focus a lot on, on the long-term mm -hmm. impact of menopause on women's bodies. So that is my personal focus. However, mm -hmm. I really always felt there was this gap. And I feel that you yeah. and Rich Roll and some other people mm -hmm. that are become aware of are really filling that gap and talking maybe a little bit more to men and making men feel more comfortable about aging. And we know that one of the issues or challenges, I should say, that men yeah. have as they get older is connecting and maintaining yeah. those social connections. And I really feel that with what you're writing and probably what you're teaching yeah. at the Modern Elder Academy is to help men become more in tune with that part of themselves. W would you agree? Yes, I would. 
And let, let me tell, just take 30 seconds to, to give the origin story of Please. MEA or the Modern Elder Academy. So as I said earlier, I was called the Modern Elder at uh, Airbnb as the in-house founder to the um, three found, to in-house, set, uh, in-house mentors of the three founders. When I was finished with my full-time work there, I started writing Wisdom at Work down in Baja. I had a home on the beach. And one day I went for a run on the beach and I had a Baja aha. I had an epiphany, <laughs> which was, why do we not have midlife wisdom schools? Why don't we have a place for people to reimagine and repurpose themselves? So that's how MEA came about six years ago. We have a campus in Baja. We have a campus in Santa Fe, New Mexico that opens this spring. And we have online programs as well. So... I knew initially when I was creating MEA that a lot of women I met in their 50s, because I started it when I was in my 50s, were feeling a little, they're feeling invisible. Yeah. But there's a power in the invisibility sometimes. I mean, there's like a sense of like, okay, you know what? I am no longer the new sex object. And a lot of them had more confidence in the workplace. And also a lot of women feeling free. Like, you know, I'm through menopause. I am empty nest. I may have gotten divorced. And I actually feel like I have freedom in my life. Yes. So I saw women in their 50s, like, yeah, challenges, but also a sense of like the opening up. But what they could use then is like, okay, what's the roadmap? What do I do with this? So there was a, a little bit of hope, but a lack of programming to support them. And right, of course, of there's guidance. The, uh, the, yeah, exactly. For men, it's not about invisibility. It's about irrelevance. And yeah. what I saw for men in their fifties is a growing sense of, oh my God, I no longer have relevance in the world. And because men, I mean, there's so, men have so many things working against them here. Number one is because women have multiple roles and are very good at juggling multiple roles in their 20s, 30s, and 40s. When, you know, the kids go away, that role can be painful. Emptiness can be painful, but it's not the end of the world. For men, there's usually two roles. I'm the provider, and I'm the family man. If And again, I'm talking quite traditionally here, by the way. Yes, absolutely. But we're also talking about this age group, and a little. uh, some of that is still present. That's correct. So if a man has these two roles, and... All of a sudden, from a career perspective, they start plateauing in their 50s, which is true in terms of their salary. And sometimes they feel like, oh my God, they're coming face to face with ageism for the first time. And if you're a straight white man, this is the first time in your life where you've had a demographic form of prejudice against you. But if you're a straight white man, like you're a bit shocked by the fact that the world doesn't kowtow to you. The OK Boomer meme was meant for you because you were the one who was talking about how the world works to young people and not really sort of having, try to understand context before you were sort of sharing your wisdom. And so long story short is men struggle and they also struggle, as you said, because they have not built the social infrastructure, the emotional insurance of friendships that women often have done a better job of maintaining. Yes, in our 20s, 30s, and 40s, we are so busy, and let's even say 50s, so darn busy that it is easy for friendships to lapse and to the practice of friendship to atrophy. And that's why MEA is so important for men. Not only is it maybe the first time they've been able to communicate vulnerably in an environment that felt safe, and that's a muscle that they weren't used to, and they were able to start building new friendships. And they were able to start understanding where their value, their gift, their mastery, their wisdom is that, you know, I like to call it same seed, different soil. Over the course of a career, you've built a seed, a seed of wisdom, a seed of talents and, and skills. And the question is, where do you plant that seed? It might be in a fully different garden, as it was for me, a longtime boutique hotelier who ended up going into a tech company. Airbnb. Right. And how do you plant that seed in such a way that it's fertile soil and you value it as well as other people do? So men, I think, need it more, need MEA more, but they still only represent uh, about 30, 38% of the people who come to MEA. So I was it's, curious. It's, I was going to ask you, is it 50 50? Yeah. yeah but the demogra- I bet it'll end yeah, up demog- being that at some point. I think so. Uh, demographics are about, you know, again, 
not getting into the non-binary piece of it, it's about 63% women, 37% right. men. Average age is about 55. Mm -hmm. We've had people as young as 25. Like, who's a 25-year-old coming to the Modern Elder Academy? But we've had, we've, we've had a lot of- Because they want to learn from their elders. They, they, this they is a very evolved young person, right? They want to learn wisdom. So our, our program yeah. basically has four pieces to it. It has navigating transitions because we have more transitions in our life than ever before. This is my two grandfathers both had the same employer for 40 years, not the same as each other. They lived in different places, different employers, but they didn't have more than one employer. They had one. Right. And so today, you know, we have 12 or 13 employers over the course of a, a career. So navigating transitions to the first. Cultivating purpose is the second key pillar of our program. The third is owning wisdom, meaning learning how, there's a beautiful quote by David Viscott, the purpose of life is to find your gift. The work of life is to develop it. And the meaning of life is to give it away. And so helping people to understand their gift and then understanding how to give it away is the third piece. And then the fourth piece that's the umbrella of the whole program is how do we reframe our relationship with aging? Because Becca Levy at Yale has shown that when people shift their mindset on aging from negative to positive, they gain seven and a half years of additional life. Now, this is more life, Barbara, than I mean, if you actually stop incredible? smoking. D I hope everyone heard that. Say it again, Chip. Yeah, I'll say it again. So Becca Levy at Yale, her, she's been able to show that when people shift their mindset on aging, and not just for a day, but for, on an ongoing consistently, basis. Consistently. Make it a consistently, habit. Consistently. Make I like it a habit. Say. Not a, a one-off. Exactly. That's exactly right. So if you shift your mindset on aging from a negative to a positive, you gain seven and a half years of additional life. Now, if you stop smoking at 50, you gain four years. If you start exercising at 50, you get about 2.8 years. So actually shifting your mindset on aging gets you more longevity, additional longevity than stopping smoking and starting exercising to get together. And yet we have all kinds of public service announcements, PSAs for stopping smoking and starting exercising. We have no PSAs for the pro-aging message. We have no public service announcements saying, hey, here's what gets better with age. And so the combination of my book, Learning to Love Midlife, and MEA are really meant to be a pro-aging message that's sort of a living laboratory for the great work that Becca Levy has done at Yale. Yeah, it's, it's really wonderful. And you're right about the PSA. There is no PSA for it. You're the PSA for it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, yes. and there's a lot of focus, as we know, on the idea of longevity, but so mm. much of it is focused on the physical, the, you know, what are the supplements? I mean, what, the you know, what can you do? biohacking. Thank you. Biohacking. And, you yeah. know, I listen to all of that and I read all of that, but what you're talking about is a mindset. And that's really so critical to aging better. One word, and it was the first pillar of the MEA that you mentioned, is change. You said transition. Mm -hmm. I yeah. like to say change. To me, that word defines what midlife and then the rest of life is all about, or really what life is all about. It's about change, especially at this time. I use the word change often. You use in your book and in your TED Talk and everywhere when you're doing interviews, a much more poetic word, which I think is beautiful. And I'd like you to just share the backstory of it. Chrysalis. Oh, the chrysalis. Yes. Well, let's go back to, I don't know, first grade. And we learn about in our little you know, science class about the magical path of the butterfly, which starts as a caterpillar in midlife, goes into the chrysalis. And then in later life, it becomes a butterfly. So if we think about that era for the butterfly, the caterpillar consumes and produces that it's eating leaves and, and it really bulks up the week or two before it actually spins the chrysalis. It eats twice as much as it normally did. And then, so, you know, in our twenties and thirties and forties, we're consuming and producing that's, you know, and busily doing our thing. The caterpillar moves into the chrysalis for the transformation. And there's a liminality to that. To be liminal is to be in between two things. We're liminal when, when we're in adolescence. We're between childhood and adulthood. And quite frankly, we're liminal when we're in midlife. We're between early adulthood and later adulthood. And there's an element of middlescence that is similar to adolescence because we're going through all kinds of changes, you know, hormonal, emotional, physical, identity transitions. Yep. 
So the chrysalis is the idea that in midlife, you're going to go through a lot of transformation. It may feel dark and gooey and solitary at times, but it's actually where the magic happens. And on the other side of it, breaking out of the chrysalis is this butterfly that is pollinating in the world. So it's like the caterpillar produces or consumes, the chrysalis transforms, and the butterfly pollinates, maybe pollinates its wisdom in the world. And so I like to now think of midlife not as a crisis, because that's the number one word attached to midlife. <laughs> not that C word, but a different yeah, C word. But a different C word, the, the chrysalis C word. And, and thank God the two words are almost sound exactly alike, crisis, chrysalis. Yes. So I'm trying to popularize the idea of the midlife chrysalis. And we're getting some definitely some traction here because it's helping to give a different narrative to what midlife's purpose is. If you think midlife's purpose is to be like Kevin Spacey in American Beauty and to get really depressed about getting older and wanting to be an adolescent again, and so you buy a red sports car, you quit your job, buy a red sports car, and then you have an affair, have an affair. with your daughter's <laughs> best friend in high school. <laughs> that is not a good look for midlife. <laughs> and, and I don't think it is actually a look that defines women. You know, that's the male version of the Hollywood trope. Right. But the truth is most people don't have that experience, men or women. Right. Most people have what they feel like in the midlife, 45 to 50 especially, is somehow they're getting the game of life wrong. And so what we desperately need is new schools and tools and rites of passage and rituals to help people to understand what is going on in their life, not just physically, but psychosocially, meaning psychology the psychology of aging, as well as the sociology of aging. Because you mentioned it earlier, the reality is almost every research study from Blue Zones, who are partners of us, ours at uh, MEA, to the Harvard following study. following them uh, for years. And the Harvard oh study, gosh. right, you referenced that, Harvard the, the study, happiness study. Amazing. Uh, uh, all of this shows the same thing, which is those who are living into their 80s and 90s and are healthy and happy have the number one common variable is how invested were they in their social relationships in midlife. And so part of what we help people to see is like social wellness is as important or maybe more important than personal wellness. Yes, your sleep, your exercise, and your nutrition, all important, but your social wellness, you know, illness starts with an I and wellness starts with we, your social wellness is going to have the biggest impact on how happy and healthy you are later in life. Yeah, I'm so happy that Dan Buettner is uh, getting all the press that he's been getting the last few years yeah. with the documentary. Yes. And of course, his books that are always coming out with different aspects of Blue Zones, Living. It's really very inspiring. And it's so he's nice on that our he's- our faculty. Yeah, it's so great. Yeah. I have to come there when he's there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah he, He's, he's wonderful. He and I taught last year a workshop together. And now we have two, between two and four Blue Zone workshops a year, but he doesn't always teach them. So, yeah. No, it's wonderful. But the, a big point of what he talks about in everything is this, the socialization, keeping those social yeah. connections going. We know that. And thank you for that. Chip, this was an incredible conversation. Mm -hmm. I thank was you. so looking forward to it. <laughs> thank I really you, feel like we're, you know, on uh, same mind, same mind. In well, all of we're this. both we're both activists. I call myself now a midlife activist, which yes. I but you know, you're we're aging activists. Mm -hmm. And I think there are more and more of us out there. And what's fascinating is just how much the press is is jumping on the bandwagon. I mean the fact that you know, the longevity is a topic that's you know so popular these days. Yes, and the fact that you know the demographics of the U.S. show that yeah, a, a continuing growing percentage of the population is fifty and older. Yep, not only because we're living longer, but also because we're having fewer babies. Exactly right. Exactly right. Lots and lots of reasons. And this is the reason, everybody. I'm holding it up for those of you watching. Some listen. Some watch. His new book, Chip's new book, incredible. It is Learning to Love Midlife. And this is a bestseller already, as we know. And it's because there is a need for people to get inspired to take control of their aging. And that's how I feel about it. And, you know, I like to say we can't control getting older, but we can control how we do it.
And that means yeah. making all of these choices. And doesn't it come down to choice, Chip, every single it, day? It does. I think I read somewhere that we make on average 35,000 choices a day. Most of them are teeny tiny. Some of them yeah. are really big. But those little choices matter. So make good choices now to age better later. Simple, yeah. right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Chip, give us, we covered so much. Like, do you have three or whatever takeaways you really want the Age Better audience to remember from our conversation today? Yeah. I mean, I would say number one is the, the social wellness, the idea that friendship is a practice. And if you feel out of practice, uh, you can get back in practice by reaching out to people who you haven't talked to in a while or yeah. deepening friendships that you already have or making new friendships. And, you know, MEA is a great place for that because we have actually 26 regional chapters around the world as well. So our alumni are very active in terms of being active in their, in their communities. And you can learn more about MEA at meawisdom.com. Yes, there'll be a link. Yeah. Secondly, I'd say I, one of my favorite questions to ask in a workshop at MEA is, what is it that you know now or have learned now that you wish you'd learned or done 10 years ago? <laughs> so you think about that for a minute. Like, okay, what's the thing that you now know or have done, but you wish you'd done it earlier or learned it earlier. But here's the more important question. 10 years from now, what will you regret if you don't learn it or do it now? And yeah. I, when I asked that question at 57, six years ago, that led me to learning Spanish because I was living in Mexico most of the time where our, camp, our MEA first campus was or is. And it also uh, t led me to surfing. But at yeah, 57, I that I, that's great. I had a, like, like, <laughs> like, oh, but like at 57, learning to surf at 57 or learning Spanish, it's very easy to have a mindset saying, nope, too old to do that. Right. But when you think about it in the future and realize that 10 years from now, it'll be harder to do that. I might regret it. Then it, anticipated regret is a form of wisdom. And that is, you know, I'd say a second thing I want people to take away is that becoming a beginner again and learning how to actually be curious and open to new experiences are very correlated with living a longer, healthier life. Yeah. And then finally, I would just say, I think one of the things that gets better as we age, it's the 12th of the 12 reasons, is we learn how to be less compartmentalized. We actually learn how to become whole. We're growing old, but we're also growing whole. And in growing whole, it means we're taking the curiosity and the wisdom and alchemizing them, the extrovert and the introvert inside ourselves. And we're making them somehow the alchemy of the two, uh, gravitas and levity, yin, yang, male, female, all of these qualities, as we get older, we actually learn how to turn them into gold by learning how to fuse them together. And that is uh, one of my favorite chapters in the book. It's a little bit more abstract. But when you meet someone who's 80 years old and they're glowing and radiant and present, it's often because that's what they've done. They have alchemized all of themselves. They have integrity because they've integrated all of the parts of themselves into one whole human that you see in front of you. And when you have that experience meeting someone like that, it touches you. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm sure that you have people like that coming to MEA. All the time. But they might come to like that, but a lot of them actually leave. It's more like- Yeah, that right. That's very good. They come a little <laughs> fragmented. They come a little bit like Humpty Dumpty falling off the, the wall and the pieces having to come back together. But in the course of a week together, they feel better. And frankly, most importantly, it's the social connection of their cohort and their regional chapter into the future that actually helps them have the confidence- and the sense of support that helps them to have courage moving forward. Just so the audience knows, is there a difference between the new one that's opening up, the new MEA in Santa Fe to the one in Baja that's been around for six you know, years? Like a big, just so they know? The difference, uh, there's Other actually- I have a daily, <laughs> Yeah, I have a daily blog and I, I actually say like, should I do Baja or Santa Fe? If you go to the MEA website, you'll see blog and, and just- do a search for Baja Santa Fe and, and you'll see my post about it. It goes into more depth okay. on this. What I'll just say briefly is from a content perspective, they're the same. Obviously, being on a beach in Mexico is one experience. Being on a 2,600 acre regenerative horse ranch just outside of Santa Fe is a different experience. The Santa Fe experience 
because as two workshop centers, re, uh, retreat centers on the same property, sometimes we have larger workshops for famous people like Richard Rohr or Michael Franti or Liz Gilbert. I mean, you know, we'll have larger workshops. So and when I say larger, I mean 40 to 60 people. Yes. Whereas our, our normal size workshops about 20 to 25 people. Mm -hmm. Really wonderful. Thank you for Thank all you. you're doing to help us all age yeah. better, Chip. Really, just, And I love this conversation so much. I'm going to listen to it over and over and over again. <laughs> <laughs> I will too. Thank you. Thank really, you, Barbara. Th and I hope you'll come back again. Yes, I'd love that. Okay. Thank you so much. Thanks for tuning in, everyone. If you enjoyed this episode of Age Better Podcast, please do a few things. First, share it with all your friends and family. Then, subscribe to Age Better wherever you listen to podcasts, including YouTube, so you never miss a single episode. Finally, if you have ideas for topics you want me to cover in a future episode of Age Better, send an email to agebetterpodcast at gmail.com or reach out to me on social media. Until next time, remember this. We can't control getting older, but we can control how we do it. Talk to you soon. Age Better Podcast is a proud member of the Sound Advice Network. Sound Advice, women's voices amplified.